Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon and thank you all for joining us. My name is Sean Vroom and I'm the director of the New Jersey Brownfields Assistance Center at NJIT. Uh, today's webinar will be covering the New Jersey Economic Development Authority's Brownfields Loan Program. Uh, we in the New Jersey Brownfields community have been anxiously awaiting this program's launch and recognize how valuable a funding resource it will be to those pursuing Brownfields cleanup and reuse. Uh, the New Jersey Brownfields Assistance Center at NJIT is very pleased to be supporting EDA in this webinar and look forward to continuing supporting its Brownfields program. Uh, but before we proceed, uh, I would like to quickly go over a few housekeeping items. First, uh, the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on New Jersey EDA's website. Uh, all participants will be muted during uh, the webinar. And if you aren't, if you could please do so, uh, I'd appreciate it. Uh, and I'd ask that you submit all your questions via the Q&A pane, not the chat pane. Uh, there's a difference. I mean, if accidentally you do, it's okay, but if you could kind of put them all in one spot and make it easier to go through at the end when we do our Q&A. Next slide, please. So today we're gonna to be hearing from Tim Sullivan. He's the Chief Executive Officer of the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Uh, as well as Elizabeth Limbrick. She's a senior Brownfields advisor also with NJEDA. Next slide, please. In this webinar, uh, it will provide participants with an overview of EDA's Brownfields loan program. Uh, first, Tim is gonna discuss the program's alignment with the governor's plan and NJEDA's mission. Then we're gonna be hearing from Elizabeth who will be uh, who's gonna be managing the loan program and she's gonna provide an overview of the program She's going to discuss its terms and conditions, eligible activities under the program, base eligibility requirements. She's gonna be discussing the scoring uh, as well as rate reductions and how to apply to the program. Uh, once Elizabeth has discussed the ins and outs of the program, we'll have a, a Q and A segment. We will have the opportunity to get further clarification uh, as well as get any of the questions you might have answered. So with that, I will turn it over to Tim Sullivan. Great, thanks, Sean. It's uh, it's great to be with uh, sorry, great to be with you, great to be with Elizabeth, uh, and with such a great group of folks uh, participating on this call. Uh, you know, on behalf of Governor Murphy and our entire team at the EDA, uh, I want to thank you all for taking the time to to dial in or WebEx in and learn about this exciting new program, which really does represent a really important step. Uh, in the direction we've been talking about for almost three years, in my case, uh, of um, broadening and deepening how we engage with uh, community development and brownfield redevelopment and more sustainable system development uh, throughout the EDA and throughout our throughout our um, throughout our administration. This is something that you know our, our renewed and enhanced commitment to brownfield redevelopment um, is something that uh, the she has about uh, ten business hours left of being the commissioner, but Commissioner Catherine McKee, my dear friend over at DEP. Uh, and her great team, Olivia and Sean, and the folks that um, uh, and Bill and the teams within Brownfield World and, and DEP, you know, met early on in the Murphy administration. Said we really ought to step it up and try and put some resources and, and, and really put some uh, spring in our step with regard to Brownfield redevelopment. Something I spent a lot of time on uh, in my previous role in Connecticut. It's how I got to know Elizabeth Limbrick um, when she was in her prior role and I was in my prior role. And then when I had, came to my new role, I said, "Why don't you come work with me in my new role and we'll have a new role together?" Uh, and been thrilled to have her be part of our leading our team. And leading the charge on brownfield uh, redevelopment sustainable systems for us so um let me uh, jump in and walk through some slides and again we want to really get to the meat of this program uh, of what we're here to talk about which elizabeth will walk us through uh, which is this really exciting brownfield loan program but um just to situate this again with governor murphy's economic uh, development plan revitalizing brownfields is really a a, a critical part of our strategy uh, not just within eda but within uh, dep and i would put dca and other places on that list as well we really want to focus on supporting sustainable, um, particularly urban, but not just urban um, uh, economic development. Uh, investing in brownfields makes sense for so many different reasons. It's a win everywhere, everywhere you look. Uh, it's great for economic development. It's great for neighborhood um, uh, you know, quality of life. It's good for public health. It's good for environmental health. It, it's just, there's so many reasons uh, to support this. And so revitalizing brownfields also is uh, you know, one of the centerpieces of Governor Murphy's economic development strategies in, in so many different ways. Next slide, please. Um, and so the, the tool we're here to talk about today or the program we're here to talk about today, the loan program really is um, one of a suite of tools uh, developed uh, largely by Elizabeth and her, her colleague, Elizabeth George-Denero, who's on the call as well. 
uh, and our team within EDA and our partners at DEP to really step up our um, step up our game, step up our efforts around uh, Brownfield redevelopment. Um, the Brownfield Assistance Center and NGIT is something we've been helpful, uh, hopefully helpful. Um, certainly been, we've at least been financially helpful, uh, if, if nothing else, uh, in, in helping to step that up. Uh, we've worked really closely with Catherine and her great team on the Community Collaborative Initiative and expanding that and, and uh, broadening that out from its uh, early successes in Camden uh, to, to go to more cities and more, work with more mayors. Uh, we have this Brownfields Loan Program, which we're talking about today. We've got federal funding for the first time in forever from the EPA uh, to support a new Brownfield Impact Fund that will roll out later this year. And uh last but not least and from a dollar's perspective the biggest piece of the puzzle which i'm really excited about um we have a new brownfield tax credit uh incentive that uh, was included as part of the governor's uh, the bill the governor signed uh, just last week in hamilton um, uh, where there are a number of brownfields and a number of wonderful other features to hamilton but there's certainly hamilton's a good example of places that have um, you know both smaller scale and larger scale sites that need some help to get redeveloped the brownfield program or you know, the tax credit that's in uh, the bill it doesn't exist yet. You can't apply for it. Don't get too excited. We have to stand up the regs and Elizabeth and both, both Elizabeth's on this call will be very busy uh, over the next several months um, standing this program up. So this is just a bit of a commercial for one that's coming down the pike, but it's a 50 million, five zero million annual uh, program to support project up to $4 million, 40% of the remediation costs. It's a one-time tax credit. This will function and feel more like an historic tax credit or more like an affordable housing tax credit, as opposed to some of the other EDA programs, which are like uh, split out over 10 years. This is a one time you get a credit. You can either finance it or just cash it against your um, uh, against your tax liability if you have one. It's going to be awarded via competitive application process. Hint, it's going to look that competitive application process probably look a lot like the competitive process for this loan. So um, the same criteria, the same policy ambitions, the same uh, kind of whole of government approach we're taking to this loan program will take on the grant uh, on the tax credit program as well. Uh, really importantly like the loan program in this tax credit program, it supports a comprehensive um, environmental issues uh, toolkit. So not just the dirt, not just what's in the ground, which is super important. That's first and foremost in our minds, of course, uh, but uh, you know, uh, hazardous building materials as well so that we can um, you know, preserve and protect historic assets as well. We don't want to knock, you know, if, we, if there's a building that just needs to get cleaned out and can get redeveloped, um, and that particularly if it's got historic significance, we have an historic tax credit in the, in the uh, recovery package as well all the better. Uh, what what better way to invest in our communities than to re, uh, redevelop and re, repower um, existing sites, existing buildings. Uh, and so uh, this can be really, um, hopefully, uh, a multi-pronged or sort of multifaceted tool. Uh, next slide, please. And again, I'm going to, I'll wrap up here and hand it to Elizabeth, I think, but um, you know, the, the loan program, this is a $15 million loan program that we're really excited to applicate that launches today. This is sort of the, the, the announcement, the maiden uh, voyage of, of the good ship Brownfields loan program. Um, again, really important, we think, to support, particularly, you know, when the economy is not great and, you know, clearly COVID has done a number on the New Jersey economy, just like it has the entire American economy. It's actually a really good time to be thinking about uh, Brownfield remediation because now is a good time to be getting sites ready for when the economy fully recovers uh, to get uh, cleanup done, to get assets and resources in place to advance the planning for um, you know, redevelopment of sites and projects. And so we're really excited to bring this loan program to the table, principally for developers you know, and nonprofits uh, to really support a whole range of reuses of New Jersey's brownfields. New Jersey has so much going for it. Um, one of our challenges though, is we do have a legacy of industrial contamination in, 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 our, in our cities and in suburban communities as well, rural communities too. And so we have uh, really no choice but to pursue a smart approach to brownfield redevelopment if we're going to support uh, redevelopment broadly. Uh, so we're excited to bring this tool to the table, uh, this brownfield, loans pro Browns, yeah, brownfield loan program to the table. Um, and with that, I'll hand it to Elizabeth to take you through all the, all the particulars. But thanks to Elizabeth and to her colleagues and team for standing this program up and our colleagues within EDA as well and within DEP and others who have uh, been vital to getting us to this launch point. Elizabeth, over to you. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, we're really glad that you could be here. I know brownfields are near and dear to your heart. Um, and so, you know, I agree with everything you said that this is such a great way to get resources into distressed communities and really um, start pushing for that economic growth. So um, the Brownfields Loan Program, which I know is why uh, folks have tuned in today, uh, I'm going to take you through that. So as you can see on this slide, you know, kind of a couple of things I wanted to highlight on this program is the 
This does actually provide financing for demolition and asbestos abatement and lead-based paint removal. And the reason I'm highlighting that is because there are a lot of other programs out there that do not cover those things. So we're really proud that this program does cover that. Um, I also wanted to highlight what favorable terms we have, which is that we have a 10-year term and there's no payments at all for the first two years. And then it actually goes to interest only for the next two years. And I think, you know, when you think about how brownfield projects typically proceed, um, having that kind of structure to the loan really is going to help make these brownfield projects um, really doable. And then the last piece is that, you know, we start with a base rate of 3%, but we have the opportunity to give you some rate reductions as, as well if you meet specific criteria. So a little more about this program. So what I do want to tell you guys is that this is competitive. So this is an interesting twist on it. And I think a good way to explain this is that you are competing for access to the loan pool. Um, but once you get to that loan pool, you still need to pass our underwriting process. Um, but this particular program provides financing to potential brownfield site purchasers and current brownfield site owners including local government redevelopers who intend to develop commercial, which could include uh, manufacturing, by the way, retail or mixed use developments, expansions or reuses. And I think Tim mentioned this, the total funding pool is 15 million, which is huge. I mean, we are really proud of that, that we are able to get $15 million for this program. And the loan amounts, the minimum is $100,000 and the maximum is $5 million. Again, we're accepting applications now. We just opened um, the application portal this morning. You can go to our website to find out more. Um, and we are accepting applications through April 13th. Um, I mentioned it's competitive. I did wanna also just mention about how we're going to be doing disbursements. Um, so you will get an initial disbursement upon, upon commencement of the work and then additional disbursements are going to be made as project components are completed up to um, the 10% retainage that we're holding back at the end. Another important piece here is where you can get um, email questions to. This is our dedicated email address. It's brownfieldsloan at njeda.com. Um, we are asking that all questions and answers go through this particular portal so we can keep track of everything. We will have an opportunity on today's webinar to also do questions and answers, but I just want you to know that's where you go. Um, up until March 25th, we will accept questions. So the terms, we mentioned this earlier, it's a 10 year term, no payments at all for the first two years. Can't stress how great that is. Then interest only for years three and four, followed by full amortization for the remaining term. And there's no pre-penalty for prepayment, no penalty for prepayment. Um, what I do want to make sure that you're aware of, though, is that the full repayment of the loan is due at either the end of the loan term or when you um, close your construction financing. So that we do have, um, you do have to take us out when you get your construction financing. That's an important point. Um, a little bit about the fees you can see listed here. Um, we do have an application fee of $2,500 that is non-refundable. Um, we have a commitment fee and a closing fee. Both of those are 0.875%. Um, <clears throat> on to some of the conditions. So I did want to also just kind of point some of these things out early so that you're aware of them as you're thinking about um, if this is a good fit for you, that you need to know that you will have to put a lien on your property um, subordinated to the mortgage, purchase mortgage, and it will be removed upon your repayment. You'll also need to record a deed notice. And that deed restriction requires that for 10 years after the completion of the remediation, that the redevelopment is consistent with what you told us you were gonna do when you put in your application. So what we're saying is the proposed end use and the factors that we considered at the time of application for your eligibility, um, for the scoring and for your interest rate reductions is in fact what you're doing. The next point here is about the retainage. Again, I mentioned that earlier, we have a 10% retainage of the total loan amount that will not be fully dispersed until your project receives either an RAO or an equivalent document 
uh, showing that the remediation has in fact been completed. We're also expecting that all cost estimates will include a contingency of at least 15% of the total cost estimate for the established remedial activities. I really want to drive this next point home. This is really important and something you really need to think about as you consider applying for this program. Prevailing wage and affirmative action requirements will apply to this. Um, and it not only to the remediation part of the project, but also to the redevelopment project. And this also carries through to your subcontractors. So borrowers will need to maintain and submit certified payrolls to us to document compliance. Um, and then just kind of delving a little deeper into prevailing wage. Prevailing wage applies to construction, right? That's one of the, the things that it talks about. And if you're thinking that, well, what I'm doing isn't a construction project, you're probably wrong. <laughs> anytime you are drilling, anytime you are digging, that is considered construction. So if you're using a hand auger to do a boring, if you're using a shovel to dig, a post hole digger, a backhoe, um, in fact, the collection of soil uh, samples, groundwater samples, are considered construction or alteration work um, as referenced in the public works definition. And it even uh, extends to, if you think about um, vapor intrusion and collecting uh, vapor samples from inside a building, if you're going to be using a drill or something like that, again, um, prevailing wage definitely kicks in. So um, you'll be wanting to think about that as you put together your cost estimates for this. And I also wanted to just note that the um, Prevailing Wage Act has a, a new piece to it, which is this ap apprenticeship program. Um, all construction contracts awarded in New Jersey that require payment of prevailing wage must also provide proof of valid construction contractor registration certification and proof of participation of registered apprenticeship program if you're employing craft workers. Um, and I also wanted to mention that if you are including any subcontractors, um, they would also need to be registered. And we have more information, well, the um, Department of Labor actually has more information at that website shown on this slide. Oh, one last thing on that slide. I did want to mention about owner equity, by the way. Lastly, um, there is a requirement that applicants must provide owner equity equal to a minimum of 10% of the appraised value of the property in a remediated state. Um, and equity can be a lot of different things, right? It could be cash, it could be development fees, um, costs for remediation and redevelopment, project feasibility that occurred within the 12 months prior to application, property values less any mortgages or liens, and the portion of the developer's fee that is delayed for a minimum of five years. Um, and any other investment by the developer in the remediation or redevelopment project that is deemed acceptable by us. Um, federal, state, and local grant and federal state tax credits are not considered equity. So what can you use this loan to do, right? A ton of things. <laughs> this is what we're really excited about. So. You know, think about your typical um, environmental investigation and assessment at a site. You can use it for investigation purposes, soil groundwater investigation. You can use it for hazardous materials assessment and surveying. Um, you can use it for the actual site remediation, for waste hazardous materials and waste disposal. Again, the really key thing I think here, the building and structural issues, the demolition, the asbestos abatement, PCB removal, contaminated wood or paint removal, and other infrastructure remedial activities. You can use it for long-term groundwater monitoring or natural attenuation, engineering and institutional controls, planning and, and engineering and environmental consulting, and attorney accounting and financing fees. And what I would note there, though, is that um, your soft costs cannot be more than 20% of your loan amount. The base eligibility requirements. So there's a certain like bare minimum 
threshold that you have to pass to even be considered um, for scoring. If you don't pass these basic requirements, you don't even pass go, and your application will be rejected for being incomplete, okay? So this is what you first have to do. Um, you have to show us site control or a path to site control. And you can do that through, um, you know, if you own the property, give us a copy of the deed. If you don't own the property, um, give us an executed letter of intent signed by uh, the applicant and the current site owner, dated as well, um, a copy of the purchase contract for the proposed site, as well as any financing agreements associated with that purchase. Uh, the next thing listed here, we also are requiring a letter of support from the mayor of the municipality where this is located. Um, I do make a note that if um, you're in one of those few municipalities that doesn't actually have a mayor, it would be from the governing body. Um, you, if you're a municipality, you have to, and you're subject to getting local finance board approval prior to applying for a loan such as this, then you would need to show us that you have secured that approval, in fact. Um, the next one is the plan for redevelopment. So we're specifically asking that you include a proposed reuse of the site, and you need to provide a description of the relationship between your reuse plan to the applicable local redevelopment plan, zoning, and land use. You, you want to tell us, how does this all really fit together? You also need to provide us with an environmental report by an LSRP, and then if you're also doing uh, structural remediation or demolition, something like that, you would want to have the appropriate qualified professional, such as a New Jersey licensed professional engineer. Um, but you need to show us that the site is a brownfield site and that it is known or suspected to have that environmental contamination. Under this program, you cannot double dip with your costs. And what we're saying here is you really, you can't be duplicative of what other state and federal grants that have previously been awarded, right? You can't use that for the same things you're using this program for. And of course, um, the costs have to be associated with the remediation project. If you look on our website, we have a little bit more detail on this, but um, two important points I wanna mention here, they're not on the slide, but um, one is if you had been previously approved under NJEDA's Brownfields and Contaminated Site Remediation Reimbursement Program, that's the tax credit program, um, you are not eligible. What I will tell you is this is a very small universe of projects. I'm going to say it's something in the three dozen, uh, you know, a list of about three dozen sites, projects. Uh, if you had been previously approved under the Brownfields and Contaminated Site Remediation Reimbursement Program, you would not be eligible for this. Projects previously approved under HDSRF can't use these funds for the same uses. Um, so you have to differentiate and show us um, what you got HDSRF money for versus what you're asking this money for and show us how that's different. The next point is that you need to provide an appraisal showing that the remediated property has an appraised value that's equal to or greater than 100% of all your debt financing, including this brownfield loan. And um, if not, you would need to provide some other sources of collateral. You, as I mentioned earlier, also need to provide equity equal to 10% of the appraised value of the property in the remediated state. And um, you cannot, the applicant cannot have caused or contributed to the contamination. Um, we're carefully not using the word responsible party because we are allowing for folks who have um, a, a uh, responsibility under the New Jersey Spill Act um, just by virtue of being a site owner. Um, those folks can actually come in and we'll talk about that later. Um, you know, what those specific things are, but essentially if, if you've actually been responsible for um, or you're an individual or entity who have common ownership or control with entities who are responsible for the existing contamination of the site, um, or you've indemnified a responsible party, 
um, or a party uh, who has common ownership or control with a responsible party, you would not be eligible. You do need to, again, include a plan for reuse, and that future use of the brownfield site has to be commercial um, or mixed use. So again, commercial could include manufacturing and retail uses. Mixed use can include residential uses at the brownfield site, um, but it cannot be 100% residential. It would have to come in as a mixed use. As with our other programs, the redevelopment project has to be economically feasible and it has to show a funding gap exists. So what do we mean? Economically feasible is defined as having enough cash flow to repay the debt financing, including the Brownfields loan. The funding gap can be supported by a certification from the applicant that after all, um, making all good faith efforts to raise additional capital, that additional capital could not be raised from those other sources. And then the last bullet point on this slide is, um, and we'll talk about the scoring a little bit, but we have a scoring uh, matrix. There's 200 points available. You have to get at least 75 points to be considered eligible for this program. Um, and then once we get to that point, we're gonna actually rank all of them and those with the highest scores um, would receive the priority to the funding. So, here we go, scoring. So again, if you pass that last slide where you get your baseline eligibility, your application goes to the scoring committee. Again, since we have a limited, full, um, limited pool of funds, we're looking at 15 million, which is a pretty big pool, but it's still limited. Um, we are going to use the scores to determine the rank of the applicants, and then the highest ranking applicants get first access to those funds. Um, I do wanna be very clear here that just because you score well doesn't mean you will pass our underwriting analysis. You still need to pass an underwriting analysis to be approved for the loan. The scoring process, there are some general categories and that's what we're looking at on this slide and I'm gonna have a lot more detail on the subsequent, subsequent slides here, but um, the kinds of things we're looking for generally, um, Nonprofit status will help you. You'll get additional points. You don't have to be a nonprofit, but you get additional points for that. Um, we look at the brownfield site location. Is it in an opportunity zone? Is it in one of those community collaborative initiative cities? Is it um, in the top 50 distressed MRI? We look at the proximity. There's an uh, opportunity if you're close to public transportation. Um, very specific criteria we'll talk about later that you can get some points for. Um, we look at the consistency between what you're proposing to do and how that fits in with the municipal county redevelopment plans. We wanna see economic benefits. We're the uh, economic development authority, right? So we wanna see job creation, capital investment, projected tax revenues. Um, we wanna see projects that are related to the innovation economy. So you know, for each of those things you can tick off, you can get more points. Of course, we need to see financing. Um, we want to see that there's a need for financing, but also see that the project is viable. Public health and environmental benefits are also very important to us, as well as you showing us that you have um, engaged stakeholders. Again, there's 200 points available. Um, again, a minimum of 75 to proceed. Um, those, that, those that don't receive at least 75 will be declined. Now, I'm going to take you through each of these factors that we're looking at. First up, um, I mentioned about being a nonprofit. So basically, if you're a nonprofit and you can prove it to us, you get five points. The next one is economic distress. So again, I mentioned that being one of the 50 most distressed municipalities based on the um, DCA's 2017 Municipal Revitalization Index, or MRI, um, that's a pretty big one. You get 20 points for that. If it's located, if your site's located in an opportunity zone, you get points. And if you are in a municipality supported by NJDEP's Community Collaborative Initiative, you would get additional points for that. And there are um, 12 cities um, with that. You, DEP has them listed on their website as well as we do. The next one, um, I mentioned about the public transportation. This is a very specific criteria. And I apologize, but I have to kind of read this almost word for word here. 
So we're looking at brownfield sites that are in um, planning area one as designated by the state plan, so the metropolitan areas, and are within one half mile radius with bicycle and pedestrian connectivity to the midpoint of a New Jersey Transit Corporation, Port Authority Transit Corporation, or Port Authority Trans Hudson Corporation, rail, bus, or ferry station, and that does include all light rail stations um, or a high frequency bus stop that's been certified by the New Jersey Transit Corporation. And if you can do that, you can get 10 points for that um, if, if your project happens to be located there. So the next one is consistency with local plans. I mentioned this earlier, this is important to us. Um, we want to know that this is something that the, the community is wanting <laughs> and this fits in with their vision. So we're looking at whether or not um, the redevelop there's a redevelopment plan from the host municipality and this project's consistent with that. We'll be looking at um, the zoning status that you provide us and whether or not that's consistent with what the end use is that you're proposing. We'll be looking at whether or not the, um, if you provide us with this, that the site plan has already been um, approved by the municipality. I mentioned economic benefit. Again, this is big. This is worth 35 points. So the kinds of things we're looking for here. Um, will the redevelopment of the project site result in an increase to the host municipality's tax base? We'll be looking at the number of permanent full-time jobs um, as a result of this project. We'll be looking at um, how significant the estimated private investment is that will occur as a result of this particular project. Will the redevelopment of the project site grow the number of small businesses or attract employers to the municipality or the region? Does the redevelopment of the project site include a plan for local hiring of local residents? And then if it does, um, does it also incorporate workforce development opportunities for those residents? We also will be looking at whether or not the primary use of the redeveloped site is gonna be related to the innovation economy that I mentioned earlier. And so those things are um, information and high tech, life sciences, clean energy, advanced manufacturing, advanced transportation and logistics, finance and insurance, and non retail food and beverage. The next criteria is um, project viability and the need for financing. So here, the things we're looking at are the level and experience and qualifications of the applicant and whether or not you can demonstrate to us that you have a history of completing um, other projects of a similar size and scope successfully. And then we'll also be looking at your strategic partners and whether they have that same uh, demonstrated history of success. We'll be looking at the presence and amount of other funding commitments available to support the project. We wanna know whether or not um, this brownfield loan is in fact necessary to complete the project. Are there, and, and it better be, because that's kind of, you know, that's something you really do need to demonstrate to us. Are there any DEP or EPA enforcement actions currently present at the site? Have all local, state, and federal approvals that are necessary to advance the project, have those, have those been received? Um, then we actually are looking at um, whether or not a, a preliminary site assessment and site investigation have already been completed. Um, that would help us to determine that you, know, you have, understand what's going on and you have a good sense of where you're going. Um, we added the next piece, or is a preliminary site assessment and site investigation not necessary? So there may be instances, I'm thinking particularly around something like a demolition project, where maybe those um, specific kinds of reports aren't necessary. So that's where that question is getting at. And then finally for this one, are the public utilities required for the redevelopment of the project site um, already available at the site? Criteria seven, so this is public health and environmental benefits, and you can see this is very important to us. There are 35 points available here. Um, so the kinds of things we're looking for on this, the length of time that the brownfield site has been abandoned or underutilized as a result of the contamination that exists at the site. We're looking at whether or not there's a direct relationship between the environmental contamination and the prior use of the site. We're looking at whether or not the project is meeting an unmet neighborhood, municipal, or regional need? 
does the site uh, redevelopment of the site feature um, things that will promote or enhance walkability or bikeability? Does the proposed project incorporate higher standards to address sea level rise, increased temperatures, changes in groundwater table, increased rainfall intensity, or other climate impacts that may affect the performance of the site in the future? So we're really focused on climate resiliency here. Has the project demonstrated sustainable practices that you will follow during the awarded phases of the project that would um, include incorporation of energy efficiency or green energy? And then has the project demonstrated other public health and environmental benefits? And criteria eight, our last one, again, uh, stakeholder engagement important to us as well. Has the applicant identified stakeholders critical to the success of the project? And then um, have you identified roles for those stakeholders in helping you achieve your objectives? Does the stakeholder plan include active stakeholders that represent local environmental justice interests? That's very important to us. Has the applicant identified the communication channels that will be used to communicate with the stakeholders? We want to know if the project has been discussed at an open public meeting or if the project is on the agenda of an open public meeting at the time of the application. And then we want to know whether or not you have provided ample opportunity for meaningful engagement with the community. And for example, we want to know, um, you know, has this stakeholder process actually produced feedback? And has that feedback then been incorporated into the project? And when you add that all up, um, it's 200 points. So that's all of the scoring criteria. The next thing I'm going to take you through are the rate reductions. So we talked about you start at 3%, right? But you can reduce that um, by 20 basis points for each one of these criteria that you can hit on this um, down to a floor of 2%. So the different things you could do, um, you can have a mixed use residential project consisting of newly constructed residential units where the developer will reserve at least 20%, but not more than 50% of the residential units for low and moderate income households. If the project is in an urban food desert community and it provides a food delivery source, and by that we mean access to nutritious foods such as fruits and vegetables uh, through grocery operators, including but not limited to a full service supermarket or grocery store, or other healthy food retailers of at least 10,000 square feet, including but not limited to a prepared food establishment selling primarily nutritious ready to serve meals. For the healthcare uh, or health services center with a minimum of 10,000 square feet of space devoted to primary health care or health services and is located in a distressed municipality with an MRI of 50 or lower. Uh, if a project qualifies as a tourism des destination project, now what we mean by that, there's uh, a very specific definition. It's a non-gaming business facility that will be among the most visited privately owned or operated tourism or recreation sites in the state and which has been determined by us to be in an area that's appropriate for development and in need of economic development incentive assistance and that it will also um, be located within this established tourism district, which will have a significant impact on the economic viability of that district. The project, um, if it includes an electric vehicle charging station installation with at least 25% of the parking spaces located um, at the redevelopment project, you could get a rate reduction there. We're also looking at projects that would incorporate um, the ability to convert a parking area um, into commercial space if there's been a decrease in demand for parking. If the project includes an incubator or collaborative workspace, that's also available for a rate reduction. And then finally, um, if the project includes the revitalization of historic site or structures defined as an income producing structure or site associated with the history of New Jersey, that is on either the state or national register of historic places or is eligible for placement on those registers. Before I move on, I just wanna note again about the deed restriction. So 
if you are applying for these rate reductions, your deed restriction will reflect that. And again, that deed restriction is for 10 years after the completion of the remediation. And you'll have to be, that deed restriction will require you to be consistent with what you said you were going to do. So hopefully at this point, you guys are like, yes, I'm super excited. This is definitely a program I want to apply for. How do I apply, right? So the application window is open now. It's open through April 13th. We have the application and user's guide available on our website. Uh, you can go to njeda.com slash bfloans. It'll take you straight there. Prior to submitting an application, uh, we are asking that applicants do email us at that dedicated email address of brownfieldsloan at njeda.com so we can assign you a Brownfield loan officer. There is, again, a non-refundable application fee. And then I'm going to take you through the required attachments um, on the next slide. So if you remember before we talked about some base eligibility, there are things that you need to provide to document your baseline eligibility for this program. If you don't provide these things, your application will be considered incomplete. So it's very important that you include all these items. So first off, we do have a Brownfield loan certification that needs to be signed by the authorized representative. We'll talk about that later. Tax clearance certificate printed in our name, NJEDA's name. <laughs> um, please note that's only valid for six months. Um, and you can go to the website uh, shown on the slide to um, obtain your tax clearance certificate. It's part of the state of New Jersey's premier business services portal. There's an act, environmental activity summary. We'll talk a little more about that later. Um, there's a lot of information that goes into that. Again, we talked about proof of site control before. So either that um, copy of the deed, a letter of intent that's been executed by both the applicant and the current site owner and is dated, um, a copy of the purchase contract for the proposed site, as well as any financing agreements associated with that purchase. We talked about the support letter from the mayor or the um, governing body if there is no mayor. A property appraisal dated within three months of the application submittal showing the property value at the time of application as well as the value of the property in the remediated state. We're asking for um, any term sheets or commitment letters from any lenders or um, other sources of funding to the project, including other federal, state, or local grants if applicable. Information from the lenders should reflect why the full project cost cannot be provided. That will then demonstrate that funding gap that we talked about earlier. We're asking for a timeline and construction schedules for both the remediation phase of the project and the proposed redevelopment phase. We want to see copies of contracts with your remediation professionals and contractors if you have them, supplemental information to validate your rate reductions, and um, again, if you are a municipality and local finance board approval is required by either the local finance board or the municipality prior to applying for this loan, then you would need to include documentation that you have in fact received that approval. Um, and then lastly on this, we talked about affirmative action and prevailing wage. We have a notice that you're going to have to sign saying you've read it, you understand what it is. We talked about scoring. I took you through all the different uh, factors that we'll be looking at. Here, um, these are the attachments that we are asking you to provide so that you can help us to give you the best score possible when we're looking at this. Um, this information, again, it's not technically required. It, you don't have to provide it in order to um, get that baseline eligibility, but you do have to provide it in order for us to be able to award you points in the scoring. So. Um, these are just examples of the kinds of information you might provide to us to support your school score. This is not an all-inclusive list, but we wanted to have something so that you had some idea of what kinds of things we're looking for. So the first one, you know, just is about, you know, are you a nonprofit? And if so, just give us something that validates that, right? Um, note that I did not include criteria two and three on here because most of those are like location-based things and we'll be verifying those things. So things like, um, are you um, an OZ? Are you an opportunity zone? Or are you um, one of the 50 most distressed communities based on the MRI? 
we'll, we'll be verifying that on our side. Um, <clears throat> criteria four about the consistency between project and local redevelopment plans. You're going to want to provide links or copies of any applicable um, land use or redevelopment plans from the host municipality. Um, for the economic benefits, if you've done a market study or feasibility study that validates the projected economic benefits for the proposed end use of the site, um, for example, job creation, capital investment, projected tax revenue, you'd want to include that. If you don't have a market or feasibility study, you'd want to provide some other documentation that could demonstrate the economic benefits of the redevelopment project, particularly related to job creation, capital investment, and projected tax revenue. Under criteria six, oh, um, and also I meant to say um, for economic benefits, we'd also want copies of any plans of your hiring of local residents and workforce development training for those residents. Criteria six, that's a project viability and need for financing. So the kinds of things you might want to give us so that we could give you those full points, copies of any and all local, state, and federal approvals necessary to advance the project. We want to get an overview of um, who you are with your background and your experiences. Provide us with some evidence of successful completion of projects in similar size and scope. Include the um, dates that you completed those projects and something similar for your strategic partners as well. For criteria seven, public health and the environmental benefits, you know, if you're, you're telling us that the project has um, energy efficient or green building standards, then you know, provide a letter from the architect that demonstrates that. Give us some information about the prior use of the site and how that was related to site contamination. And then under the last criteria, uh, stakeholder engagement, provide any copies of the stakeholder engagement plans that you reference. Um, if the project was discussed or is expected to be discussed in an open public meeting of the host municipality or county, provide us a copy of the meeting minutes. Um, or if it hasn't yet happened, provide us with the agenda with the date, time, and location of the meeting. This next slide um, here, where we talk about information for financial analysis, some of this is actually overlaps <laughs> with the other stuff we've talked about, either the required stuff or the stuff that you would provide for um, documentation um, for the scoring. But um, this comes directly from our underwriting staff at our underwriting team here at EDA. And these are the kinds of things that that team is going to want to look at when it moves to underwriting. Um, so again, for applications that meet that minimum score and the, they've passed the baseline and there's funding available to satisfy the loan request in full, then it will advance to our underwriting department for a financial analysis. At that point, an underwriter will be assigned and they will then, they, they have the ability to reach out to you. But if you have already submitted all this information, we can move your application through the process much more quickly. So we are asking that you provide as much of this as possible uh, when you submit your application. So um, if it's not there, and um, it gets to underwriting, the underwriter may then reach out to you to ask you for some of these things. Um, <clears throat> you will have five business days to provide that information to the underwriting officer. So the kinds of things they're asking for, um, historical financial statements for the three most recent uh, years, plus interim statements for the current year if the, finance, if the fiscal statement is more than 120 days old, or sign completed business tax returns for the three most recent years. Any uh, owner that has more than 10% is a more, more than 10% owner. Uh, they'll want a copy of those most recent tax returns and personal financial statements that are not more than 90 days old from the date of application. Again, you know, this kind of gets back to some of the stuff we're already asking for, but it's very similar. A summary of the type of, of organization, including your history, description of the organization, your ownership structure, org chart and identifying owners and percentages of ownership if you have multiple partners, subscription agreements for all partners or members for investment funds contributing equity to the project, three years of projections including the balance sheets, operating statements, reconciliation of the source and application of funds, and detailing of the assumptions used in preparing projections. Listing of applicants' current projects in any stage of development and planning, identifying project type, 
size, location, funding sources, owner equity committed to project, anticipated funding closing date, and completion occupancy date. They also want to see the history of successfully completed projects. And again, that's that company overview we talked about, background and experiences um, of projects that are in similar size as scope and scope, and include those completion dates as well. And then lastly, um, a schedule of portfolio um, assets. I mentioned before I told you I'd talk a little bit more through this. This is the Brownfield certification, and this is where we talk a little bit more about that responsible party piece. This is also on our website. What we're saying here is you cannot have caused or contributed to the contamination at the site. So what you're certifying to is that you have not discharged any hazardous substance, hazardous waste, or pollutant at the site. You have not been in any way responsible pursuant to any law for any contaminant at or emanating from the site or contamination that has emanated from the site other than by acquiring ownership of the site, if applicable, after all of the discharges occurred at the site. So that's where we're allowing uh, folks who have um, become a responsible party by virtue of only acquiring the site. That's, that's how um, this is working. And then you also cannot have aggravated or contributed to the con contamination. You can't be affiliated with a party that has related to any of those uh, items in number one through three above. And you can't have indemnified any party or affiliate related to the activities described in one through three above. I talked about the environmental activity summary. I did mention that there's a lot of information here. You can see our website for more detail. But what we're asking you for here um, are things like copies of your environmental reports. You're going to want to attach those. At least one of those has to be prepared by an LSRP. And then if you're doing non-LSRP, non-site remediation work, like, just, like demolition and a, asbestos abatement, um, we would also want reports that are prepared by um, either a PE and a HERA certified professional, a uh, New Jersey certified lead inspector, a certified industrial hygienist, or other appropriate licensed certified professional. We want some kind of environmental contamination history or a basis for why contamination is suspected at the site, uh, things you'd want to talk about, um, how and when the site became contaminated, whether a prior use of the site is related to the suspected contamination, and if the environmental concerns are unknown um, or if the land has been vacant or abandoned or underutilized for many years, tell us why you think that there's contamination there. We're going to want you to give us a brief narrative um, to describe the investigative and remedial work that's been performed at the site. Think of it as like an executive summary. We're going to want to have the site and project information. Again, a narrative summary. You know, things that, that we would like to see. This is um, not an all-inclusive list, but things like um, the description of the contamination, um, the proposed investigation, assessment, and remedial activities at the site, what are the current uses of the site, how was the site acquired, if applicable, um, a current interest in the redevelopment, what is the proposed redevelopment that will take place following remediation, any construction or redevelopment plans, and again, that proposed future use. We are asking for a map showing all areas of concern and sampling locations, both existing and proposed, as well as the remedial actions. We're asking for a detailed and itemized third-party cost estimate that includes all eligible costs associated with this loan, and it needs to be signed by an LSRP or other appropriate licensed professional. We want itemized costs. We want you to include that 15% contingency. We want you to show us a lot of detail in your calculations. For example, if you tell us that you're bringing in um, certified clean fill, how did you determine how much fill was needed? Um, if you're doing demolition, give us the dimensions of the structures. If you have a subcontractor and their costs are greater than $25,000, you're going to want to support that cost estimate by um, a, or want to support that with a cost estimate by a potential subcontractor. And again, remember, prevailing wage does kick in on this. So make sure when you're doing your cost estimates, they're reflective of that. 
We also want you to include a table of activities and estimated milestone dates, including as appropriate submittal dates of the reports to uh, DEP and other regulatory agencies. Oh, quickly just taking you through, um, this is our process. This is um, what would happen if you did submit an application. Again, we would do that baseline eligibility review. Um, if it passes that, we would score it. Uh, we'd notify our board. It would go to underwriting. Underwriting would evaluate whether or not um, we can give you a loan. If, and then if yes, it would go to a board approval. If not, you would be declined. Um, if there's not enough funding available, um, there's potential to be waitlisted to see if anyone um, with a higher rank um, falls out. If you are approved and you get your loan, uh, you would then go to closing. Again, remember there's a lien and a deed restriction requirement. We talked about the disbursements. Um, there will be project monitoring, especially associated with the prevailing wage aspect, affirmative action, 10% retainage. Then you have your repayments. And finally, at the end, after you've repaid your loan, um, you have your loan close out and removal of the lien. You know, just generally looking forward, um, Tim touched on this. We have so much going on between environmental justice, climate resilience. Um, all of these things are tied together with brownfields and sustainability. We're all interdependent. This is all tied together. Um, we see language access and community engagement as a big piece of this. Now we have the Brownfield uh, incentive or tax credit coming down. Plus we have that Brownfield impact fund, which is the US EPA revolving loan fund that we'll be rolling out later this year as well. So with all that, I realize we are almost at the uh, anointed hour, but I do wanna take time to answer questions and um, we will keep this open as long as we can to answer as many questions as possible. Um, I do want to remind you that this is a competitive loan program and therefore the NJEDA is going to be limited in the type of support that can be offered during a competitive round and we can't provide any specialized assistance to a specific applicant. We can't give you that unfair advantage. We are asking that questions be submitted um, if you don't want to ask them here to that dedicated email address. Um, we'll accept questions up until March 25th at 5 p.m. We are not ex accepting phone calls or faxes. You're not, do not contact us directly. Please use that dedicated email address and we will um, put together a FAQs document that will be posted on our website. So Sean, do you want to start with the questions? Sure. Uh, we have a few here. Um, first, well, first, let's get out of the way there's because it's been asked a few times is will this presentation be made available either on the EDA website or will you be sending it out? It will be made available on our website. Okay, great. Uh, first question here is, is the project cap of 4 million for total development costs or for the cost of remediation? So I believe that question goes back to Tim's slide on the um, incentive program. So let me go back there. That's not specific to the Brownfield loan program. That's gonna be the new um, tax incentive that's coming out because that we don't have a $4 million cap on our program. We have a $5 million on the loan. Um, so this is what it is. Project cap $4 million, which is 40, and you get 40% of your costs. Does that answer the question, Sean? Uh, well, they have a follow up to it. It says, and if the project is greater than 4 million, can they still apply for partial coverage? Yes, I believe so. I mean, we have to develop the program, <laughs> but I would imagine the answer would be yes to that. Okay. Next question is, what is the minimum commercial component requirement for the Brownfields loan program for mixed use building if it is primarily residential? I don't believe we have a specific percentage um, that is required, it, the rules just say that it needs to be mixed use. Okay, uh, if the use was to change, is there a process by which the EDA would allow for a change in use? No, I mean, we're asking you to sign a deed restriction that says for the 10 years after remediation that this is what you're going to do. So that's what we're expecting. 
Okay, next question is for mixed use. Is there a threshold for the commercial size in comparison to the residential? You know, I, I will have to verify this, but um, again, all our, all our rules say is just that it has to be mixed use. It does not specify a specific um, percentage component. Okay. Um, this goes to the scoring. Uh, why would you give points to a site that has an environmental enforcement action against it? We are actually doing the opposite. You're getting points if you don't have one. So you get zero points if you do have one, five points if you don't. Okay. Do you get extra points or deductions if you are in a UEZ? How would this work if there is a lien on the site for repayment of cleanup work by a state or federal agency? Okay, so the UEZ is not specifically um, something you get points for, but it probably ties together with like opportunity, may tie together with an opportunity zone and likely would tie together with the MRI and possibly um, also be able to get some points depending on where they're located, possibly in the Community Collaborative Initiative, CCI Cities. And then the second part of your question was about liens. Uh, yes, it's how would this work if there is a lien on the site for repayment of cleanup work by a state or federal agency? Hmm. I'm going to have to review that one separately because that's a very sort of more specific question. Okay, uh, well, we'll keep moving along. Um, okay. Let's see. I believe that you said the brownfield loan has to be repaid when close on the construction when you close on the construction loan. Please confirm. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, do you anticipate having an annual application period from January to April in subsequent years? I think we need to see how if this program is successful and if there's a high demand for this program um, and then, of course, if there's funding available. But, um, you know, I think if if we can show those things, I can make a good argument to uh, Tim Sullivan, our CEO, for why we should do it again. Okay. More is always good. Yes. When, when does interest begin to accrue when the funds are drawn down or when the project is completed? I believe they, and I will confirm this, but I believe they start at closing. Okay, and the last question here is repayment is expected after construction financing or construction takeout financing. It, at construction financing. Okay, that's the last question we have. Okay, excellent. So, Elizabeth, you could just go to the last slide. Okay. Too far. Oh, we I'm missing your slide, Sean. I apologize. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, let me I'll go ahead. So that, that basically concludes, uh, you know, wraps up the QA segment. But before we close today, um, I'd like to provide participants with the New Jersey Brownfields Assistance Center's contact information, which was supposed to be up on the slide. I'll I'll input it into the chat uh, feature. Um for those of you that are familiar with the center, it's the first of its kind uh, and only center that solely focuses on and serves New Jersey uh, and is free is a free resource to its county and local governments. Uh, the mission of our center, the assistant center, is to educate and engage communities around Brownfields issues, to provide free guidance and resources to county and municipal governments, challenged with navigating the redevelopment process. Uh, and to develop tools, strategies, and resources, create partnerships, and provide subject matter experts to Brownfield challenge communities. Um, so it's the center's goal uh, that all New Jersey Brownfield sites be transferred, uh, trans transformed into community assets. Uh, and we're here to help you along the way. Uh, a key feature of the New Jersey Brownfields Assistance Center is our Brownfields Help Desk. Uh, you can reach us by either phone or email. Uh, so, for instance, for instance, you know, you have a quick question such as, you know, when is EPA coming out with their next round of Brownfield grants, or you want to know if uh, we have an example of a successful EPA Brownfields grant application that you can use as a model, you can email us uh, with those questions and we will uh, respond as quickly as possible, which is usually very quickly. 
Uh, and again, you know, we, we do tailor our assistance uh, to fit what, you know, your particular set of circumstances and needs. So keep that in mind, you know, and there, you know, so there may be times when your assistant needs, you know, aren't as simple as a quick question um, and answer, uh, you know, through call or email. So you might even not know what type of assistance you need, only that you have a Brownfields challenge and that's okay. You know, just reach out to us. Um, you know, there's many times, um, you know, through the course of, I'm sorry, through the course of the conversation, we can get uh, an understanding of the challenges that you are facing and then suggest ways in which we can provide you with assistance. Uh, the key takeaway uh, is that we're here to help you. So reach out to us. Uh, great. We got the slide up. That's our contact information. So reach out whenever you want. Um, so before we sign off, I just want to again, thank all of you for taking the time uh, to participate in today's webinar. I want to thank Tim and Elizabeth for an extremely informative presentation. Uh, and with that, we'll close out the webinar and uh, just want to say so long to everybody and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you.